You're listening to Staying in the Game, a Plum Dragon Herbs podcast where we have conversations about mindset and techniques for staying at the top of your game. Plum Dragon Herbs provides herbs and D. Jow to support all types of martial arts training and wellness programs. Our podcast welcomes voices from all corners of the martial arts and health communities. We understand that there are many conflicting martial arts and health philosophies, and our podcast showcases the wide variety of opinions that exist. The views expressed by our guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Plum Dragon Herbs, its staff, or partners. Today's host is Josh Walker, the original founder of Plum Dragon Herbs, who continues to share his love of Chinese medicine and martial arts with our listeners. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for tuning in on uh, another episode of the Plum Dragon Podcast. I am Josh, and I am here today with Jonathan Bluestein. Uh, I, I don't know if I've got that pronunciation perfect, but... Yes, um, the, that's the original Polish one. <laughs> excellent. All right. Good, good. Uh, and so Jonathan is joining us all the way from Israel, and um, we are ultra excited to have him on the show. So, Jonathan, would you mind meant just giving a quick intro and, and letting people know what uh, some of your background. Yeah, sure. So th- first of all, thank you for having me on the show, Josh. I'm thrilled Absolutely. to be here. Um, well, a little bit about myself. Uh, I have been in the martial arts for about 17 years, um, almost 18 now. Started when I was 16 years old. I started out with Western boxing. I uh, did Western boxing for two years. Then I, I got into Shito Yu Karate and did that for another year and a half. And from then on, I've been in the traditional Chinese martial arts. And that's been uh, my martial arts love affair thus far. Uh, mm-hmm. Summarized briefly, uh, my teachers have been in Western boxing, Coach Ran Antal, who's uh, nowadays a uh, uh, well known coach in the Toronto area. In Karate Itzi Cohen sensei who is a dear friend and colleague of mine nowadays. Um, he's, uh, I think, sixth, if not seventh dan in Shito Yu Karate and Shoin Yu Karate, teaches in Israel. And uh, my main teacher in traditional Chinese martial arts is Shifu Nitsan Oren, uh, who is my teacher and, and dear friend. He's like family, he's real family to me, as I'm his Kung Fu family. It's a very traditional relationship. Um, I also have my uh, dear, wonderful teacher, Sifu Safir Tal. And I have my uh, most recent teacher, uh, Master Shifu Professor Stephen Jakovic, many things. Um, under Shifu Nitsan Oren, I have uh, studied and practiced uh, Xing Yi Chuen and Pi Guajang. Xing Yi Chuen and Pi Guajang, two traditional Chinese martial arts, uh, which I've also studied here and there under his own Shifu, my Shigong, late master Zhou Jing Xuan from Tianjin. And under Sifu Sapirtal, I'd studied the traditional uh, sovereign brain mantis kung fu. And under Shifu Steven Jakovic, I'm studying Bagua Jam. And uh, here and there, I, I dabbled in a few other styles, but uh, the martial arts I've mentioned are those that I've practiced long term. Gotcha. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. You mentioned Sapir Tal, and I, I thought that name sounds familiar. Um, and he was, uh, he was Southern Mantis. Uh, was he, he was a Puyi Southern Mantis, right? Yes, exactly. It's, it's nice that you remember. Indeed, uh, he's a very prominent teacher of um, Southern Mantis, um, the most well-known teacher of the art here in Israel, possibly in the Middle East. And yes, his Sifu, my Sigong, uh, is late Grandmaster Henry Puyi, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, may he rest in peace. He was a, a very high-level master of the internal arts. And my Sifu, Sapirtal, is one of his eight or nine disciples, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I spent four or five years way back when in the Southern Mantis world, so I mm. think so. Pretty sure that that name sounded familiar. That's, oh, which again, which lineage of Southern Mantis did you study? Um, that was that was Haygood. That was under Roger Haygood. Mm, I see. Yes. So at at one point, um, Sifu Haygood studied under uh, Master Henry as well. 
Yeah, yeah. It's all there's a bunch of politics, but at the end of the day, it's it's just like uh, you know, football teams play football and, and they they seem like they're enemies, and then afterwards they go out and drink together. So it's it's all it's all connected, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, well, well jo- Josh is be, is trying to be uh, nice and and politically correct here. I, I I would say something without without talking about people specifically. I used to think that the worst politics in martial arts are in Wing Chun. But oh boy, when you get into South Mantis, <laughs> it's a, there's a lot. There is a there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot. So I don't know. Interesting. If we if we have time, then we have a bunch of things we kind of want to chat about. If uh, if we have time, maybe we'll we'll breach into Southern Mantis because I do um, I do I did enjoy enjoy a lot of my time there. So um, anyway, you know, kind of moving on. You know, with with that background in place. Um, and you, you know, you, I know that you just moved to, or moved back to Israel. So what, what does the scene out there look like? What's the, what kind of martial arts are going on and what's the culture and the feeling and what, what's the latest? Okay. So we have a really interesting martial arts scene in Israel, which is quite eclectic. The entire country could be said to be so. Uh, we, we have a, a culture which is at its core Jewish culture but nonetheless, we have Jews uh, having immigrated to Israel for basically all four corners of the globe. And the Israeli culture, like I said, it's maybe, I'd say at its core, it's maybe uh, 50% Judaism. And then the other 50% uh, is made up from a lot of other things. I'd say primarily Western, specifically American culture even. Uh, and a lot of stuff coming in from Germany, from Russia. We have, um, some would estimate, a million and a half Russian Jews or Jews of Russian descent in the okay. state of Israel. Out of So it's a million and a half out of 9.3 million people. That's quite a lot. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and in terms of martial arts, you know, a lot of them have brought all sorts of interesting, uh, sometimes even esoteric traditions from Russia, including various um, streams and lineages of Russian Sistema. Uh, for instance, I have a colleague of right. mine, uh, Sharon Friedman, uh, who is an excellent Sistema instructor. Um, and it's, it's a very, very interesting martial art. And I think it's sort of nowadays consolidating into the point uh, with which maybe in 10, 20 years, we'd be able to speak a little bit more about lineages but it started somewhat chaotic and then it, it become over time, it becomes a little bit more traditional, a little bit more lineage oriented, which is similar to the story with Krav Maga. Okay. So, so let's go back to the beginning though. So how did the martial arts scene even begin in Israel? Uh, because the state was founded in 1948. And when the state was founded, uh, there was there were hardly any martial arts around. Uh, okay. There there are a few Jews here and there who had studied either, um, the, say the the old school uh, Western boxing or Greco Roman wrestling or things of that nature in Europe, and all sorts of uh, Western style stick fighting and knife defense. But I would say likely th- there was absolutely nothing Oriental with the exception of perhaps a little bit later on, there was some judo here and there from Israelis that came back from Japan. Okay. So the beginnings of what would later be called Krav Maga were, was this mix of self-defense methods, which really did not come from a, 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 any type of direct transmission. It's so basically a bag of tricks that were collected and taught to uh, Israeli defense forces IDF soldiers in order that they could have something in a hand-to-hand combat scenario. And we're mm-hmm. talking in, in 1948, I'll bite these things still happening. And that was less common. People have firearms. So uh, how did people fight hand-to-hand? Well, primarily they just winged it. As, <laughs> as a, a real, really, like, like often happened. I mean, that's the Israeli way. People winged it and, and, and won conflicts that way. Uh, and that was, you know, say 1948 to the uh, to the 1960s, maybe even mid 1960s. Then over time, there was a phenomenon of a lot of Israelis seeking um, 
cultural knowledge and influence from outside their own culture. So Judaism, it, uh, uh, despite coming from the Middle East, has over the course of several thousand years become very tied up with the rest of Western culture. And it has this point of view from its Judeo-Christian culture. And Israelis are naturally very curious and inquisitive and their, you know, tales and myths and, and cultural uh, folk stories about, you know, the, the lands far beyond. And the Jews have actually reached China um, a very long time ago uh, via the Silk Road. So where there were Jewish communities in China, I think, uh, way back even in the fifth or sixth centuries. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, so th they're always small, but uh, th there were still Jewish communities in China when World War II broke up. Okay. Um, they, they didn't keep in touch for the most part with the other Jewish communities, but they were nonetheless Jewish. So, so the Jews had a conception of, oh, you know, China and Japan, these, these things sort of exist. And their interest in them was purely cultural. It was not religious and it had nothing to do with business or money. So people traveled to, to the Orient and the most accessible country at the time was Japan. And you had this sort of, an, again, like this cultural phenomenon of a few dozen Israelis who traveled to Japan. And I don't know how that happened, but essentially a lot of them got into martial arts. Most of them, even most of the people who traveled to Japan without the intention, you know, religiously, nobody traveled to Japan for religion. Business wise, there, there were occasions like that. But whoever traveled to Japan for culture, eh, the greater number of them got involved with martial arts of some sort. Um, I think the first was uh, Moshe Feldenkrais. Moshe Feldenkrais was a famous uh, teacher of judo who actually studied directly under Jigo Okano, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, wow. And, and famously so in Israel, uh, there was, <laughs> have you ever seen, so there's a, um, the first prime minister of Israel and a, and a very uh, famous Jewish leader uh, of his day was uh, David Ben-Gurion, right? Okay. He's a okay. first prime minister. It's a very iconic figure. He's got this bald head with... Uh, plums of hair and the sides <laughs> right above the ears. Um, there are even uh, various characters in Hollywood films that were sort of inspired by his odd look. Um, there is a post credit scene in one of the Marvel movies with Stan Lee uh, with some Martian looking fellas that look like David Ben-Gurion. Can't recall what they're called. Yeah, okay. so so he, he was an iconic figure. And one of the iconic things that he used to do is to, he used to go in the mornings uh, to the beach and stand on his head in a, in a yoga posture. And this was taught to him by Moshe Feldenkrais, the, the famous judo teacher, who was, <laughs> well, the, the two met, and Ben-Gurion, was, who's a brilliant politician, a statesman, and, and an historian, and he was many things. He was nonetheless um, a person who was, in many ways, disengaged with his with the physical experience of his body. Uh, okay. He he worked very hard in the fields and and as a farmer on occasion, but he never had any physical practice. So he asked uh, Moshe Feldenkrais Sensei, who by the way I think wrote at least two books on physical exercise, one of them purely about judo. He asked him, "What can I do to benefit my body? What kind of exercise?" And they, they talk a little bit and, you know, Ben-Gurion, like the typical would-be student, is like, nah, this is too difficult, this to this, this to that. And finally, Feldenkrais told him, you know what? What's that one thing that you don't know how to do? And Ben-Gurion thought for a second and he said, yeah, I don't know how to stand on my head. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, you know what? So that's what I'm going to teach you. So he had the prime minister of Israel go to the beach every day and stand on his head for a few minutes. And there are several pictures of him in that posture. And there are statues uh, around Israel of Ben-Gurion standing on his head in the yoga posture. This was so iconic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's a neat little, that's a neat little story. Yeah. So people knew that the person who taught him that is Moshe Feldenkrais, is this judo sensei. So later, you know, uh, as people came back from Japan, 
and they start bringing in those oriental martial arts, um, primarily judo, Kyokushin Kai Karate was very popular, Shotokan Karate. And of course, these people commingled with the political interests of the local Japanese sensei who were very eager to have someone represent them in the Middle East, which is like, you know, far and away, the other side of the globe. Yeah. Like, well, I'm going to have a representative there. So very, very quickly, sometimes, you know, within a year or two of training, they already became the official representatives of an entire organization in Israel. Uh, but nonetheless, they did not disappoint. They, used, they would either go back to Japan to train or they used to bring the Japanese teachers over. Um, I think most major streams of Shotokan and Kyokushin Kaika, they are repre- well represented in Israel mm-hmm. as a result of that. Another interesting import, I think already in the 70s, is uh, Bujinkan Ninjutsu. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so I think two or three of um, Hatsumi Sensei's earliest Western students were Israelis. Okay. And so the- lots of, of like Japanese and Okinawan kind of influence coming in. Yes, later, later yet, later still, um, there are Israelis who went to Okinawa and studied under the likes of, uh, say, Moyu Igaona Sensei and other teachers and bo- brought those uh, streams and lineages of Okinawan Kata to Israel as well. Um, later for Europe, I arrived Shito Yukate and more styles. Uh, the, the Japanese arts came later. And they came initially from Israelis who went to Taiwan because China was sort of closed up and it was difficult for Westerners to get to China until the early 1990s, right? Right, right. Okay. And, and, and then they start sipping in until, I mean, nowadays, if you ask me, um, we've got most most of the more common martial arts styles out there. You've got at least two or three lineages of self and mantis. you got got Xingyi Chuen, Bagua Jiang, Tai Chi Chuan, Tai Chi many, many different lineages, uh, many other types of Japanese, Chinese martial arts, Filipino martial arts are abundant. Um, and Isra- Israelis like martial arts. And it's actually, I-, I would say that a very high percentage of men in the country have practiced either judo or karate, typically these two, uh, when they're young. And uh, as of the past 15 years, Capoeira is becoming extremely popular okay. among children. Okay. Yeah, it's cool. all over the place. Like you see schools with hundreds of Capoeira students. Interesting. Yeah, that is kind of neat to, to see that, you know, over time where the where the trends go. And Capoeira also, I know in the last few years, has been become, gaining some popularity in various areas in the U.S. as well. So I wonder if that there's something about the newer generation of, of kids that attach to it a little bit more strongly or whether it's just, you know, trends. Well, I, if, if you ask me, and, and actually I just thought about it, there are at least two very good reasons for capoeira catching up in a place like Israel. So first is generational and the second is cultural. Uh, Israelis tend to be unruly. And they like to, <laughs> yeah, they, they do. They, they don't like laws and they, pre, they pretend to follow laws, but they don't. And I mean, in, in many ways, they're libertarian. They don't profess it. They outwardly, they proclaim like some of them, at least that, you know, they obey whatever the government says, but yeah, they don't really follow laws or rules or orders. And, you know, right. it's, it's a nation of, you know, we're not all Jewish here. There's also substantial uh, Arab population, but in that respect, they're like the Jews. These are people who like to improvise and, and create and do their own thing. Sometimes it could be in either a positive or a negative way. And when the, the, the practice method in Capoeira is as such that it allows a lot of individual expression. And I think it appeals to people who live in Israel, culturally speaking. Okay, okay. So that's one thing. And the second, I mean, is generational. I think capoeira is, is very playful in a good way, in a way that's uh, often sort of forgotten in other martial arts, especially some of the Chinese styles. In, man, in many respects, you could say that capoeira is opposite of Southern Mantis, of all lineages. It is, it is in a lot of ways, both in its body structure and like way of, of moving the body, as well as maybe the, the 
the outward perception that you get of people when you're working with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so self and mantis, I, I'm, I'm speaking as if, you know, both Josh and I have experiences with self and mantis, but, but other people may not. Self and mantis is an extremely serious martial art. Everything is geared towards that sort of conflict that is almost bound to happen. Yeah. And all the tendons are so stretched and the, and the structure is so firm and you step in this very accurate manner and the, the whole art tends to be very angular. Now, it has a lot of circles and spirals to it if you understand how to practice it correctly. But nonetheless, um, it works a lot with triangles and trying to get the opponent to basically be at the corner of your triangle, get into a sharp corner. And it's, it's very precise and the yes. movement and the movements can be very small and concise. And, and it's all, and, and because of the way the art is structured, it tends to incline people into almost sometimes a cultish following. That's not true for all schools, but it happens often. It and, does. It does. And it does have that. It's a very, um, uh, there's a very stringent way of, you know, the curriculum is stringent and the, the body is stringent. And it feels, of course, when you're learning it, right, it feels very robotic um, until you can teach your, your body how to do it. So it, it, you're right. It's, it's, it's such a different contrast from capoeira where you have to just allow, you almost have to be limp in almost a Tai Chi kind of way to allow your body to move. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and we should say, I mean, it sounds like criticism, but not necessarily so. Self no, Mantis, yeah, yeah. Self and Mantis does this to, to gain some very tremendous combative benefits. And it has to work in this very precise manner to, to the type of power that it seeks to produce and the type of um, psychological state that it needs to induce in a person in order to fight the way that the system fights requires certain modes of practice. Whilst, again, in Capoeira, you're talking about something that compared to self and mantis is more akin externally appearing to, to the lay people, uh, like improvisational dancing. Yeah. Which in a lot of ways makes it feel, you know, you feel more of a kind of, I don't, I don't want to say that Southern Mandis doesn't feel a brotherhood because some of my best friends were my training partners from way back then. But um, you certainly feel connected in a, a different type of way when you train capoeira with someone as opposed to Southern Mandis. <laughs> certainly. I mean, uh, Southern Mandis in all lineages out there say has a very Confucian hierarchical structure to, to that community in a school or in a chain of schools. And then in Capoeira, the, the training mo- modality is very tribal. Um, again, reflecting its African roots, right? Right, right. Yeah, which is very neat. And, and in, in its own respects, you know, uh, there's, there's always a lot of benefit in doing things with a certain mindset um, because you appreciate that mindset. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, so uh, I said, so oh, sorry, go ahead, go I, ahead. I just want to summarize that I said one, one aspect which I think attracts Israelis to Capoeira is the, the cultural aspect of the, the way in which Israelis prefer to, to have their um, self-expression come about without too, uh-huh. without too many rules or regulations. And the second one is a generational mm-hmm. aspect, which uh, we, we have a younger generation that feels that they want to be somewhat more playful. And I think Capoeira delivers much better on that front as compared with uh, other martial arts. Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense. That's actually that cultural piece is a really good point too. That, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And I'll add a small comment, which is also particular and extremely interesting is that Capoeira caught up very well in Israel among the ultra-Orthodox communities. Interesting. That, I don't know if I would have expected that one as much. No, it, <laughs> it, it is completely unexpected. And I think that, well, somehow, well, I, I know at least uh, 
one teacher, Maestro Cacique, um, who is very well respected. He's a Brazilian capoeira master who converted to Judaism. Okay. Okay. And so, what is the what's the religion in Brazil then? What do they? What's the what do they I, practice? Then? I, I would assume that the majority of Brazilians are Catholics, but uh, okay. I've never been to Brazil, so I, I cannot generalize. But gotcha. point being, the, I'm just the, curious. Yeah, uh, the guy. Conv- so he's a, he's a really big Brazilian guy. He's like probably six foot four. He used to also be a local boxing champion. I met him a few times. So he became an ultra orthodox Jew in Israel, and he and and some others like him who who were already who were born Jewish who studied capoeira because of their um, identification being ultra orthodox Jews and be parts of those communities already they were more easily accepted as martial arts teachers. Okay. As opposed to, say, a secular person, secular people and orthodox people in Israel could respect one another, but um, I'd say the orthodox would be a bit more suspicious if a secular person came from the outside to teach something that's kind of weird, you know? Yeah, and less, and, less likely to be accepted. Exactly. And, and somehow these um, se- several capoeira instructors and masters managed to sway um, large numbers of youth from both Orthodox communities. And it became a phenomenon since I'd say the past uh, 10, 15 years. And it has been enormously successful. I, I, I just came back from the park where I train and teach a few days ago. And there's an area, you know, with bars where a lot of people do all sorts of uh, strength training. And I was seeing like 20 orthodox guys in their late teens, early 20s doing capoeira. Oh, cool. Okay. That's neat. That's, yeah. uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, you know, being in the U, spending my whole life in the U.S., you know, I, I see the stuff here. Um, and it's like, you know, U.S. and China and U.S. and, and Philippines or whatever. Um, but to hear about Brazilian arts ending up in Israel with a, a Judaism type, like, um, like religious background there or, or kind of feel to it is um, it's an interesting thing. And I wonder, I would be interested sometime in, in looking these people up. Cause I, I, I would guess that that kind of cultural difference um has some level of influence in the art over time, right? Uh, so. Potentially, uh, potentially so. I mean, speaking of Brazilian arts, there's several more styles that are worth mentioning in Israel. Of course, we can talk a little bit about Krav Maga, but um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has been yeah, of course, uh, right. steadily becoming more and more popular all over the world, uh, but also in Israel for the past 20 years or so. And uh, uh, there are several direct students of the, the Gracie family and the Machados, um, certified by them to teach. And, you know, given the politics, uh, also a few people who are not certified, but are still teaching. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but it's, uh, I would say BJJ is all over the place and it has gone so all over the place that unfortunately, um, unlike, I think in the United States, uh, the BJJ community has been able to sort of better track who is a qualified black belt and who isn't. In we Israel, do some, we do see some people. I, I think that it's almost inevitable, right? That as it grows, there's the quality control isn't going to be as perfect, and we do see some of that in the U.S. as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I tell you what happened in Israel. Uh, prior to the arrival of BJJ, there are quite a lot of people doing uh, various forms of Japanese jiu-jitsu. Right. And now, now some a little bit more sports like, say, I mean, they call it jujitsu, so they have a few joint locks, but it's kickboxing, and and other people like sort of half and half, and whilst others still um, really traditional Japanese jujitsu from all sorts of um, koyu or gendai budo styles. Okay. Uh, and and by the way, there's also a, a lot of aikido going on in Israel, uh, primarily from aikikai, but also korindo aikido and and others. Um, and uh, Yoshinkan Aikido, uh, Korindo Aikido is uh, into itself a very uh, unique Koryu lineage, which is called Aikido, but doesn't come from uh, Moriyoe Shiba. And I actually personally know uh, Shlomo Davidsensei, 
uh, who is said to be the only uh, real inheritor of his Israeli, Shlomo David Sensei, but he lived in Japan for many years, and he inherited this whole Koryu system of Korindo Aikido. Okay. Okay. Which is a, com- a complete Koryu system, as, as is, for instance, uh, Ten Shin Shoden Katori Shintoyu. Interesting. Yeah, but so no, no, going back. Real... Yeah, so, sorry, so I, I digressed a little bit. And, and I, no, I, you're good. You're good. Yeah. So, so what happened with the Jiu Jitsu people, I mean, the Japanese Jiu Jitsu people, is that once BJJ started to be more and more popular, a lot of them sort of. Uh, so somehow suddenly became black belts in BJJ. No, oh, suddenly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, at, at times they just appointed themselves and okay. other times, you know, I, I would assume, I don't know for a fact, but it's, it's how it appears. And again, it's not the majority, but it's some of them. They basically went to some great, certain Gracies or Machados or some other people and told them like, look, I've been legitimately really doing some form of jujitsu with groundwork and everything for a long time, could be 10, 20, 30 years. We need, um, we need to be acknowledged as BJJ people because this is becoming popular. You would like to have a representative in a country like Israel, which is uh, very prominent among the world's nations. So how about we, we do this, this thing, we do this trade. Um, and you know, what do you know? Like, from say in the year 2000, BJJ was almost unheard of in Israel. Then by 2010, it's literally all over the country. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a. It seems to be. It seems to be problematic. So I mean, but it's business. It's business, right? It's mm-hmm. putting food on the table, and that seems to be more important than you know earning earning a, a rank. Uh, in, in actually in both in a, sar- a sarcastic way, I'm saying that in a real way too, <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, well, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit here and drill down and, and maybe just to give people a hook of where this is kind of going is talking about eventually some, some of the kind of cultural differences in, in the different martial arts that we've looked at, but mm-hmm. what about your group in particular? You know, what, what is uh what is uh, what is the culture and and the kind of methodology look like with your group of students that you work with? All right, so my method of instruction is primarily the traditional Chinese method. I have even moved a little bit farther away from um, the Western modalities in in recent times, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So, first of all, in Israel, what's really common is that a lot of people come come to to teach with a a lesson plan. And this is something that, like a lesson plan driven curriculum, as in for each class, they literally have a page or two or five of like exactly what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. This, This line of thinking is very characteristic of Israelis, who have gone for military service, which makes most Israelis really. Uh, myself and Mantis, Sifu, Sifu Sapir Tal, has been working with that method for decades and it's been successful for him. Uh, I can't stand it personally. I've never taught like that. The way I, that I've always taught is that generally I have a very um, well written, coherent curriculum. But when I arrive in a class, I don't have any typically. I don't have any preconceived ideas about what is going to happen unless I bought special, I brought special pads or we're going to do a, a very specific weapons class where we have a seminar or something like that. But most classes, I come to the venue. I look at the students that day. I feel what they're about that day and I flow from there. And the reason is very simple. You might come with your plans and ideas and, and what, whatever you have in mind, but one guy just got divorced and um, another gal is, 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 is sick. She's feeling under the radar. Another person is sick, so he didn't even arrive. Someone else arrives like 10 minutes late. Right. Um, someone else is injured. And then like you, you got this amalgamation of people, like each with their con- conditions or excuses or whatnot. 
And you end up with a situation where like you, you get along with your program with some people, but not with all of them. And then the next right. class, the people who might have been all right might have their issues and the other ones not. So if you work like that, you, you what typically happens within a few months, you're missing out on a lot of the things you wanted to accomplish and you really don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And now the, the more difficult route to work with is that you have to do a little bit more for personalized training with each of them, I'll bite studying in a group. And then you really have to memorize what each of them has been up to, or better yet, if they're responsible, teach them to take charge of their own training and their progression for the curriculum. And they remind you because once you get, you know, over a certain number of students that becomes very difficult to track them all. And then you have to bridge those gaps between them based on the dynamic that you see in each and every given class, which is very challenging. It, it, it requires that you, you know, bring your A game to every class, but be concentrated, understand the psychological and interpersonal dynamics between people. It's very challenging, but I think in the long term, it works better for me personally. Now, in gotcha. terms of in, in terms of saying that I stepped a little bit away from Western methods, it's not, it's not just that. Also, uh, for many years, I was teaching in a in a typical class format. We had a, an hour and a half class. Sometimes uh, I might extend it for up to two hours, but um, typically it would be an hour and a half. Um, now, personally, I think that um, a good martial arts class, a good relative to what you're each one of us is teaching. At least, I mean, in traditional Chinese martial arts, I feel an hour and a half is the minimum because if you're going to do warm-up and stretching, every, irrespective of whether you're doing it in the beginning or the end or both, that's going to take up at least 15 minutes off your time. You, you end up with, if you're lucky, you have an hour and 15 minutes and that's not a lot already. So, right, uh, right. so, so that's why I do a, a minimum of an hour and a half. So it used to be that and it, it would start, say, 7.30 in the evening and end up at, and then at nine and we'd start like on the minute and end on the minute. And if someone was late and, Oh no, you were late. Go stand the corner until one day. I think like there, there's all sorts of like silly things that, that people are told to do if they're late, like go do 50 pushups, go around around. Uh, I personally, oh, yeah. I, what I would do is I'd have them stand in marble in horse, in horse step and, and have them look at the others. So at least they do something while they stand in the corner. Right, right. We, we actually had the corner. We would call it the stable. It's where the horses stand. <laughs> okay. Yes. And and believe it or not, the idea was um, it came to me by a suggestion of a ten year old. Oh, nice. They've always the kids always have the best ideas sometimes, right? Yes, indeed, indeed. So I mean, I did it for years. Then I moved abroad and I came back and I realized, you know what? For me personally, that's not working out. It's not working out because. I'm an adult, these people are adults, and this whole thing of having to play with, like, oh, bad boy, bad boy, you weren't on time. It's like, come on, like, these people have families, you know, they could be in their 40s, 50s, 60s sometimes. It's not feudal China anymore. It's, yeah, it's modern day. Yeah, so so I, I transitioned into the model that's actually very common in China and was what was the case with my Shugong, my, my teacher's teacher, late Master Joe, which is uh, the traditional teacher is at the park and given a given span of hours. So, I, for instance, I'm at the park um, Sunday to, to Thursday from uh, 7 in the evening to 9, 9.30. And then I'm also at the park on Fridays, 9 in the morning to 12 noon. And during this, it's like an open open class almost. You're saying. Exactly, yeah. I'm at the park. You arrive when you can, for whichever, for however long you can. Even if, even if you just drop by for 15 minutes, that's also training. So that's better than nothing. Right. Uh, but if, but a lot of times people come and they would stay for the span of the entire two and a half hours. Yeah. And I'm just I like there. That. That's nice. Of course, um, this is not feasible for everybody because that takes a lot of hours out your schedule. 
If you're a full-time professional, you can do that. Not everybody can. So I, I, I'm not judging anybody who's working via you know a different paradigm. I respect what you do. It's what it what has been working for me personally. And I just recently transitioned to that modality and I prefer. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to do it, especially when it's in, you know, it's in a class setting and people are busy and, you know, scheduling things can be very difficult. It, uh, it makes sense to take away some of the stress and pressure of like, oh my God, if I'm late, then, you know, there's going to be this, I'm going to have to do this like punishment. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, because people, people want to train and there's traffic and there's, you know, supervisors who want things done at the last minute. And I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. It should, it it shouldn't necessarily be a punishment. Yeah. When we have this dynamic around uh, students being late and I'm not saying people should not be late to meetings, to the best of their ability, they should respect others and other people's time. And this, this is a bit more uh, more of a stressing issue in the United States where people believe that time is money and it's part of the culture, it's a big right. thing. Um, but I mean, nonetheless, it creates bad blood between people. So imagine the situation with me being in my mid thirties and you've got a, a student who's in his sixties. I mean, me, I, I could be his kid, right? Right. In 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 real olden times, I could maybe be his grandson, and yeah. and and I am sort of like gonna punish him for being late. It's in some ways it's sort of ridiculous, right? This interpersonal yeah. dynamic. It and, is. And and then if maybe if you're older and you end up punishing younger students, then what happens? You tend to attract those people who actually like. Yeah. Yeah. Punish me, said say I like being punished. So I mean, <laughs> like yeah. they're looking at the romanticized, you know, version of it. Yeah, and and when it's between opposite sexes, that can be even worse. Yeah, yeah. That that can no, create true. Yeah, that can create some some really um, problematic tensions. And and I've been there. I've I've been the place where, you know, you you work with a female student. And she's otherwise fantastic, but you start noticing that maybe you're applying those techniques and she's cooperative in a, in a sort of frisky manner. Ah, yeah. And, and you're in a relationship, but you're getting some very strong signals there and you have to be very careful. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember I, I did when I was studying, um, Jeet Kune Do, we did a little bit of groundwork. It was like a percentage of the population. And I remember one night we, we had this garage that this woman had built on the property um, uh, for specifically for training. And um, we used to go there and one night everybody was gone and it was just me and it was just her. And we were working on this groundwork and she was, there was something, I don't even remember what it was doing. This was probably 15 years ago. And I had to push her away um, on her chest and she was like, and I felt very strange about it. And she was like, no, look, I know it's weird, but like, you have to do this. And like, it was a really sensitive, like there are these moments like that in martial arts, right. That are very sensitive. And if you're, if we're not good about handling that, then like it can go sideways very, very quickly for sure. <laughs> so mm-hmm. on both sides of the fence, right. Cause it sounds like you're talking about the woman, you know, being kind of adding to that fire a little bit. Yes. And, and I, I should say this, this was just an example that they had in mind because it's something that happened a few times, but unfortunately more commonly it comes from the, the direction of the, the male instructors rather exactly. than the women. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. What about, um, what about your, your teachers have, did they adopt, did they do the same sort of thing? How did your, what was your experience when you were learning? Well, with uh, my teacher, Shifu Nitsan, uh, we would we'd come to the park and it, it ought to have been on time, but nonetheless, uh, it was often supposed to be maybe an hour, an hour and a half, and then that being two hours or two and a half hours. And then me and my Kung Fu brothers would stay and it would uh, prolong to, to 
maybe as long as four hours at times. Um, we, we, we came early evening and we had to leave late night. And now this also has to do with the sort of conditions that you have for training in Israel. So a few points to remember here. First of all, Israel is a very small country. It is the size, roughly about the size of New Jersey. It has a very small population of just 9.3 million people. So a lot okay. of people know one another. And in terms of um, in amongst the Jewish population, essentially everybody is uh, everybody else's relative, right? Everybody else's distant relative. So and there is this sense of cultural and ethnic camaraderie between people. It's a, it's like a closely knit tribe-oriented giant neighborhood more so than a country. And the climate is very hot. Climate is akin to something sort of in between um, Florida and California. Okay, okay. Uh, very similar to if, if someone uh, had ever been in, uh, in Greece or in southern Italy. That's possibly the closest climate and vegetation that you would see, even though the country is is getting greener by the year. We're, Jewish people are like green and we plant a lot of trees. So I, I said all of this because you can train outside for the greater bulk of the year. The winters tend to be very windy and rainy. Uh, strangely so, it rains a lot during winter and not at any other time of the year. But I would say there's maybe every year there's one half to two months which tend to be very windy and rainy. And the rest of the year, most days, you can train outside. And if you okay. can take the heat, and if you grow up in the country, you usually can take the heat if you train in the shade. Then even in blist on blistering hot days, you can practice outside early morning or late evening. And therefore... Um, you find that you are outside a lot and there, and there is a lot of young energy. And it's a very, very prominent feature of this geographical location on the planet. It's a bit difficult to describe uh, for those who have not traveled a lot throughout the world. I did. I, I visited over 20 countries and, and live long term in let's say in Israel, in China, in Canada, and in Mexico. So in four of them. Um, also visited the, the U.S. for probably a total of three months of my life and been in different places. And I would say that I haven't been to a place yet that has the same level of young energy as you do in Israel, which means, well, first of all, people tend to be a little bit too angry and too hot. Okay. Uh, in terms of, if, if you look from the perspective of Chinese medicine, there's a lot of damp heat or dry heat depending on where you're at in the country. Um, but one advantage is you have so much energy coming from sunlight and just from the, the structure of the region that people go to, they, they tend to eat very late. People might eat as late as uh, nine at night and they, and, and a lot of people go to sleep at 11 or uh, at midnight because they have so much energy. You can just work and work and go out and, and you go out, you go out at 11 or midnight and you see a lot of people still outside. Hmm. And, and the crime is much lower than it is in the United States and, and likely lower than in Canada. Albeit Canada having better um, marketing for itself as a nation. And it, it's, yeah. re it's really what it is. Canada is not such a splendid place as, as it, it pretends to be, which is partly why my wife and I left Canada. And there are many other reasons. But, and, and no disrespect to, to the wonderful Canadians. Yeah, I'm talking about the nation, the government, things like that, and the climate. Mm -hmm. But um, in Canada, there's a lack of energy in many places. I remember coming for the first time to Toronto, and we live long term in Toronto. The feeling is as if you just stepped into a graveyard. Interesting. It, it's not, again, compared with my homeland of Israel, it's a very different feeling. And you don't have nearly the same level of energy. So this, this is why and how, yeah, you might come at uh, 7 p.m. and you might train till 11 the park because you've just gathered all this sunlight energy throughout the day and you're just driven and, and you can do it. 
and it gets dark, but the darkness doesn't put you down. And because the crime is low, people are not afraid to go outside. In most places, people are not afraid to walk outside even in, in 3, p, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Um, hmm. Yeah, if it's women, they might go, you know, in pairs or in a small group. And that makes sense. Nonetheless, you know, I've walked all over the country at any hour of the day and I've never, almost never felt threatened. Now, granted, I'm also a martial arts teacher and I've, I've been a police officer for three years during my obligatory service. But still, I don't think most, it's, you'd have to intentionally get into the wrong places in order to feel free. Gotcha. Gotcha. But that's, that certainly is a nice feeling. It certainly is a nice feeling. So, yeah, I, I, actually, I got to tell you, it, it, it's a little bit of a provocative statement, but I mean, I, I got to say it on, in some venue. The American people feel that America is a free place. And in many respects, it is. In some respects, it's a much freer place than in Israel, especially with very specific bureaucracies like opening a business and, and other things in many places. It is a very free place. But there are many aspects to freedom. And a lot of them are lacking in the United States, and not because of the people who are freedom loving, but because of issues with government and bureaucracy. And what I was just talking about is one of these facets of Israeli culture in particular, in which you have more freedom than you would have in the United States, because what is freedom if you're afraid to go out on the street by yourself at night? That's not freedom. It's a very true statement. And, and and compared with China, I would go even farther because yeah, we, we all know that the Chinese government can be quite tyrannical in many respects. But there are also aspects to, to Chinese culture which are freer than what you see in the United States and Canada and all of these so-called commonwealth nations. And I'll just tease you by making you think whose common wealth, whose commonwealth, just think about that. So in China, you know, I, I remember I was in Victoria, BC in Canada, speaking with uh, fellow Dr. Yin, the head of uh, the Oshu School of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Victoria, one of the sweetest human beings I've ever met, He's ter- terrific human being. And he, he spent his childhood and, and early teens, probably until his 30s, he was in China, and then he lived in Russia and in Florida, and then eventually moved to Victoria, BC to run the Chinese Medicine College there. Okay, And he was already in, I think in the late 70s, he was already a professor in, in an, at the hospital in China in the late 1970s. And I asked him, uh, what's the place you most enjoyed living in and where you liked the culture the most? And again, he lived in, um, in China during the harshest years of Chinese communism, during the Cultural Revolution. And, and he was already mature when that happened. Probably in his maybe his teens or early 20s or something. And then he lived in China, in Russia, in Florida, and in Victoria, BC. And he said the place he liked the most was Russia. And he lived in the outback of Russia, like in the very frustrated areas in the in the Northeast. So I asked him, like, why Russia? And he gave me this super interesting answer. He said, you know, the Russian people, they had very little, but they were happy. When I came to Canada, people had everything, but very few people were really happy. Yeah. And that was a profound thing. And then I asked him about the, I, I said, I think it was during the span of the same conversation. So what about like something like the Cultural Revolution in China? Because I, I know quite a bit about this. Um, I've seen recorded lectures from Harvard and um, a few other university professors lecturing about this. And I've read about this quite a bit. And the Cultural Revolution was one of the most atrocious government chain of events ever enacted in, in the history of the, the human species. It was absolutely horrible. Um, it is estimated that Mao Zedong, throughout the Cultural Revolution and throughout his peri- um, period as the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, that he killed either directly or indirectly a few dozen million people more so than in the Second World War. And I asked him, so how was it? Was it really as they describe? And he said, yeah, in some ways, but, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, the Cultural Revolution, which was like 
a war, it is an equivalent to something like a world war in terms of the repercussions on people's lives. He said, I had more freedom than I've had in Florida or Victoria, BC. I asked him, Hmm. how come? He said, well, we lived in the outback. We lived far away in, in a remote village. And the government officials would come and cause some trouble, but they would come every few months. They might steal some money or they might humiliate some people. Okay, it was horrible. But all the rest of the time, we never heard from the government. We did whatever we wanted. We had utter and complete freedom. So what is, what is freedom, you know? So um, in, uh, and the martial arts communities are in many ways shaped by our perception of freedom. Yeah. We, we digressed into this topic, but it's super interesting, I think. Um, if, if, you, if, if you think about the implications and ramifications of insurance in the United States, and, and nowadays also in Europe, and what this has done to the martial arts community. So first of all, if you want to start a martial arts school, you have to take into account this, this aspect of insurance. And if mm-hmm. you want to teach people a martial art with full contact practice, then insurance is going to be way higher. Yeah, and, a lot of liability there. Exactly. And, and if a student gets injured, and it could be an accident, could be nobody's fault. Students, one student, two students get injured. Okay, it happens that two students can get injured over five years. Not in the major way, you know. Someone's got a torn meniscus and one had a dislocated shoulder. If you have a lot of full contact, that happens. It just happens. Could be that yeah. someone wanted something from insurance for from like a hematoma around his eye. He got a black eye, you know. It, it might not be serious at all, but he still, you know, sued the insurance to get some money. And now your insurance is ramped up and that affects the amount of money you're going to take from your students and the way that you're going to teach your martial art in class. And it's all due to the legalization of society penetrating the sphere of martial culture. Yeah, it's big. It's a big thing. It all boils down to business again. So, so, so yeah, again, no, is, is, that, is that freedom? How much freedom is that? As compared with, for instance, I, my wife and I just returned from um, eight months in Mexico. Okay. Mexico is a, I mean, Mexico can be a dangerous place, all right? In many respects. There are cartels in certain areas, so you have to know where you go. You can, it's a country where you can get stopped on the road and ask for some money. Typically, they wouldn't steal yes. all your money. But I, that's happened. That's happened before. <laughs> yeah, my dad's been stopped in Mexico while we've been down there. Mm-hmm. That happens. You you have to know where you're going, but they're not typically. They're just, it's like a. It's basically um, a hoodlum toll road, right? That's, they're just gonna. Mm-hmm. They're gonna take fifty bucks and let you go, and you better give yeah. them the fifty bucks, by the way, because you got weapons. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, they got firearms there. And so you don't want to meet with the cartels or um, you don't want to meet them on the road. And certainly you don't want to meet bureaucrats in Mexico because that's going to be the end of you. You're just going to kill yourself. <laughs> the bur- worst bureaucrats in the world. <laughs> and and they all over the country, they have a very serious water pollution issue. You get stomach poisonings left and right. It's very easy. If even a droplet of bad water touches your lips, you're going to get nasty poison oh wow and and you bet like if someone hears this that you're planning on going to mexico go because it's a wonderful country please take your chinese medicines with you because you, you, it's going to save your life okay so all that being said and considered and there's some risks and dangers mexico is a much freer country than the united states because yeah, if there's there's a lot of these these um tangible ideas of what makes freedom right but there's this whole philosophical discussion that can take place right that's like well you know the the i think the one of the best examples you had was being able to go out on the streets um in the middle of the night and not worry about things and that's not a freedom that you put into a document right and say you're allowed to go open a business you're allowed to you're allowed to go outside but if you are restricted in that way because it could mean that you your life is in danger, then there's a very real argument there that there's a whole list of freedoms that are 
less tangible than just writing down and saying we allow our citizens to do these things. If we if we think about martial arts as a as a sort of a political statement again, without get actually getting into specific politics, this or that figure or character or ideology, martial arts are in a way a libertarian statement. And I'm not saying I'm necessarily libertarian, at least not fully, but they are libertarian statement because they value freedom over safety, like the Mexicans. That's the most prominent feature in Mexico. Like you go to Mexico and what you see is, first of all, and like I, I, I go to that comparison again, I'll go back to martial arts in a second. When my wife and I lived in Canada, the government corresponds with you on a weekly basis. It's sickening. You get emails and letters and it's like, Go away, government. They're like a naggy mom. Come on. Come on. They wanted to talk with you all the time. <laughs> okay, we got my wife and I got to Mexico. First time we met the government is when we got in. Last time we met the, the next time we met the government is when we got out. And we came in with a tourist visa for six months. We got out, out of after eight months. You think anybody cared? No, because freedom. Nobody cares. Nobody, come come mm. in. Bring your bring your foreign money. Why should right. we care? And you see little kids going about um, playing with fireworks and firecrackers. And the, and, when, and the dogs, everybody's dogs go about everywhere without a leash. And guess what? They're not attacking anyone. So freedom over safety. And I, I think that martial arts do make a statement that essentially you are going to practice something dangerous with somebody else. Any real martial art has a dangerous component to it. Um, and if you're going to accept it, that means you accept, mm -hmm. at least in the, in the it, doesn't it doesn't have to mean that you're libertarian, your political perspective on society, but inside the martial arts school, you are libertarian because you value freedom over safety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point, especially when I, I think about the way that things are in the U.S. and you're not allowed to do so many things, like, for example, seatbelts, right? Um, it's a big deal nowadays to get caught without a seatbelt on, like, you know, in the U.S., they make such a big deal about it. And yeah, of course, seatbelts seat save lives, but people should be free to decide whether they want to wear their seatbelt or not. And so it's kind of this, you know, you will do these things that will keep you safe. And, and you're right that that statement that martial arts makes is that we, we would prefer to do things that we want to do um, over the safety of being told what we have to do. So uh, let me give you the, the in-between, like a third cultural perspective, which is Israel. Uh, it's quite interesting. So because you brought the, the example of seatbelts, in Israel, if you talk about seatbelts, nobody cares about the freedom versus safety sort of debate. What people care about is that in Judaism, human lives are the highest moral uh, pivot. There, okay. there is, for example, so if you're a religious Jew, then you keep the Sabbath day holy. You don't perform any work on the Sabbath. It can get as extreme as to the point with some Orthodox Jews, you know, they don't turn on the light. A lot of them don't turn on the light on the Sabbath. They just keep all the lights open or they have timers and such. Because the light goes to the power station, the power station uses fire and fire is work. So they don't, this gets crazy. That whole long, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, if they have to save somebody's life, they would use any electricity and fire and, and work and whatever necessary because there's this concept in Judaism with, with um, Shabbat. the observance of soul, of the observance of soul delays the Sabbath because it can sort of push the Sabbath away. Okay. So in okay. Israel, the debate concerning seatbelts is an, an entirely different debate, which is we need to enforce this thing with seatbelts to ensure that souls are not going to be wasted because this is the highest value. Right, right. Uh, totally different idea. But in Israel, you have sort of like the middle ground, and this also reflects in the martial arts community, and uh, with respect to... Um, 
safety versus freedom. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. This, the state has sanctioned that uh, all martial arts instructors in the country need to undergo uh, an official certification. There are a few schools around the country who have applied and their standards, like the, the school must be headed by, uh, by a doctor in the field of you know, physical education or something related. You got to have uh, someone who specializes in uh, anatomy and physiology teaches some number of hours at that. Either it even has to have like sports psychology for at least five hours. And the whole course typically takes around 250 hours. Okay. And and it's not that it's not very expensive. The price has been probably around eighteen hundred dollars, one thousand eight hundred dollars for the past decade. That's kind of the price you pay for this course. You go do it wherever you want. You get diploma and then you get it for life, and you don't pay any yearly fees or whatnot. And supposedly by law, every single instructor, every martial arts instructor in the country has to have that diploma. Do they all have it? No. Uh, but, does the, but does the government enforce it? Also no. I don't think that this... And th there is like a fine, like there's a maybe a $3,000 fine written into the law that you get if you don't abide by, by those standards, if you, do, if you teach without the diploma. The law doesn't even say if you get the fine for one violation, you get it, or you, you can get it multiple times. Nobody knows it has never been enforced. Because the mm, government's okay. like, yeah, we sort of need something like that because security, but also freedom. We're not just, we're not going to bother. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a law, but it's, it's, um, it's not like, actually, it, you know, I spent, I've spent most of my life living in Colorado. And of course, in Colorado, everybody says, oh, pot, you know, marijuana is legal. And recently, Colorado did what they call quote unquote decriminalized um, mushrooms, right? Um, mm. Hallucinogenic mushrooms. And what that means is, is very similar. What it means is that it's still illegal, but it's not a prosecutable offense, right? Like it's illegal, but they're not going to spend any time um, prosecuting cases of it that they find. So it kind of reminds me of that. It's this, the same sort of idea. Like we want you to do this, but we're not actually going to like, we're not going to do anything if you don't. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that's, that's a very common sort of situation in Israeli law with regard to a lot of things, not gotcha. just this one. Yeah. It's, it's quite common. And you know what? That brings up um, something that Confucius said, and this is from the Lunio, the Lunio are the Analects of Confucius, a, a book, which is quite short, can be read in two or three hours. And I recommend everybody read, and it's free online. You can go to Confucius.org, Confucius.org, and it's available in English, in Hebrew, in Arabic, in the original Chinese, and you can very easily switch between languages. It's it's wonderful. It's it's a um, nonprofit project that they put up, and they keep improving it over time. So the Analects of Confucius are collections of the, the, the core teachings of Confucius, which he did not write during his lifetime, but which his students over the generations have written down and edited. It's simple and straightforward in, in, in the sense that it's 499 small chapters or small verses, 499 verses, which are each either a, from a sentence to two paragraphs. It's very short. On the other hand, and, and, straight, and the language is, is often very simple to understand. But the message can be very complex and the book has to be read many times. I've read it at least 10 times in order to start to grasp what's going on. And often you need to read at least another book or two on Confucius to figure out a lot of the stuff going on there. But again, a lot of the things are straightforward. So, um, for instance, he says that the, uh, the leader... Um, the, the not the leader, sorry. There's a concept called the junzi. Junzi is the virtuous person. And the virtuous person in the community he says is like the sun and the moon. When the virtuous person, the moral person, the junzi commits an error or mistake, everybody can see because it's like the sun and the moon. But when he corrects his error, everybody looks up. Ah, uh, okay. 
So that, that's one example. Another example is, he says, where when I go, um, when I go along, I walk along two people and uh, one of them is good and one of them is bad. Then from the good person, I imitate what he's doing. From the bad person, if I think he's bad, I examine myself. So it doesn't say don't do what the bad person did, but rather think about why do you think that this is a bad person, which brings you into a whole different analysis of your own internal moral logic and moral compass. Mm-hmm. And, and one other thing that he says, he says a lot of things, and I quote him uh, profusely in my, in my books, especially in my book called The Martial Arts Teacher. If you want to go on Amazon, and make sure to buy the second edition, The Martial Arts Teacher, which is a tome covering um, all of the core essentials of what one would require to be a decent teacher of traditional martial arts. So uh, Confucius says that if you punish people in order to enforce the laws, then what you gain is obedience and people do what you want. But if you enforce the laws for personal example, then people don't only do what you want, they also develop a sense of shame. Hmm. Okay. So this is the thing. So, yeah, you Confucius deals a lot with sociology and and government and a little bit with bureaucracy and uh, personal psychology and other things of that nature. He is a, a, a people person. And he essentially says, yeah, I mean, if you're a leader or a bureaucrat or a prime minister, an emperor, doesn't matter. You can coerce people to do what you want, but you will not get their respect and you will not get them to improve as human beings. If you really want to do that, you don't do it for laws. You set up a good personal example. And then they're not only inclined to follow you, they also develop a sense of shame if they do something that goes against your personal example, which they seek to commit it. Gotcha. And, and this is yeah. very, very important for a martial arts teacher. Again, speaking of, oh, you know, this guy's late. How am I going to punish him? And all this, all this silly dilemmas, right? And, mm-hmm. and if you want to go down that route, I actually wrote, there, there is a chapter about this in the martial arts teacher in, in which I explained the best way to go about it if you have that format and people can be late. Nonetheless, I mean, if you show up on time, every time and people can see that and people know, that goes a long way in making them change. Again, of, of course, over a long period of time yeah. as compared yeah. with coercing them to do something. Yeah. Well, so thinking about this, and we're, go- we're getting a little low on time here, but... Um, Think about that idea, you know, with you mentioned with your, your book and, and the, the idea, what, um, what about this view of, of teacher in the, the context of like Chinese martial artists, right? What is, I mean, obviously you wrote a whole book about it, but if we're going to chat about what a teacher is for, you know, five, five or 10 minutes, what is, what, what does that mean for, for you in Chinese martial arts? All right. So this is a very interesting topic. And indeed, there is a chapter in my book, The Martial Arts Teacher, called Shufu, the Chinese Teacher. Now, in China, there are uh, two primary terms for teacher. Lao Shi. Lao Shi is a teacher like um, a school teacher, a gen- general generic term for teacher. And Shufu is a father teacher. So a shifu is a teacher in the context of a traditional relationship. Some people in China and the West believe that in order for someone to be called a shifu by someone else, then they must have entered a traditional relationship by ceremony. It has to be a very specific, special relationship. While some other people, such as myself, are all right with all of their students calling them shifu. But I do nonetheless have those traditional relationships, and I'll get to that in a moment. So if someone wants to be a shifu of traditional Chinese martial arts, there are several facets to it. Um, 
Firstly, and primarily, I think you have to possess a technical skill which is on par with a certain standard in your lineage, in your tradition. Now, what is tradition? I would say, roughly speaking, you could define it many ways, but something traditional, in my opinion, is something which has been passed down for at least three successive generations. So okay. um, say your grandfather invented a certain way to do carpentry. And then he taught your father. And now you are also practicing that form of carpentry that, which has been passed down um, since your grandfather, who was already practicing it for years. I would say by the time it reaches the grandson and all three generations have done it, you could call it a tradition. Maybe two generations is a little bit too short. That seems um, about reasonable, though. Like, if and you teach somebody, that's not a tradition yet, right? Unless it gets passed on <laughs> from the person you taught it to. Exactly. And one of the things which traditions allow us to perceive are standards. Because, if, for instance, if you go to, um, to a boxing gym, you, you could say that one standard is, okay, this guy can bid up um, this percentage of people. This guy can work the speed bag for these amounts of hours. But these are like, yeah, you know, actually it's, it's very difficult to create uh, qualitative standards for boxers aside for the, from their, from their uh, professional record. Because each of them brings to the table uh, entirely different sets of qualities. Because boxing is a very dynamic thing. It's not tradition. When you have something traditional, it's easier to speak about standards. And by what standards should I abide to be a teacher? So there is the te this physical, technical aspect too. Um, some people use numerical ranks some people use colors or belts or sashes or shirts or all of them together that's fine as so you just have to abide by certain standard another one is a um, professional standard i find that uh, the majority of people have not studied to be teachers i have a very good friend a grandmaster keith kensbelt from germany Grandmaster Kenspeth is uh, arguably the most successful teacher, commercially successful teacher of traditional Chinese martial arts to have ever lived. His EWTO, uh, European Wind Chun Organization, prior to COVID, they had 60,000 students. Wow. And, okay. and, and have been around for 50 years. Um, so, or is it, no, it's 45 years now, I think. And they are very long standing. Uh, they had the biggest student community. And over the years, they've taught hundreds of thousands of people, likely over a million people in total, all over Europe. They're really big in Europe. There's historical, political reasons they haven't gone much to, to the United States. So I won't get into that. But uh, Grandmaster Kenspeth, one of the things he did is when the organization became more and more successful in the, in the 1980s, early 1980s, I think it was, he rented a castle in Germany, made it its, his headquarters. He actually rented half the castle called Langenzil Castle. And I think it's, it's near the city of Heidelberg. And he created um, this venue for full-time, a full-time school for instructors where people could come. For instance, Sifu, Sifu Alex Richter, uh, my colleague from New York City, who's got some big schools there. He came to the castle and stayed there for six hours a day. I think it was six days a week for three years. And he already had some background prior in Wing Chun and, and other martial arts. He was a black, black, black belt in Taekwondo. And he was professionally qualified as an instructor. Now, this is not a statement about the level of someone's abilities as a martial artist and neither necessarily about a certain standard, technical standard, which is a separate thing but rather concerning one's qualifications as a teacher. Now, that does not mean that if you haven't undergone a course as such or something similar, you're not a good teacher. Many people are natural born teachers, but are you qualified as a teacher? And this is often a question which 
only you can answer or your teachers can answer. And maybe, maybe some of your colleagues, perhaps. So we have this technical standard and we have the professional standard of are you qualified to teach? Uh, <clears throat> my book, The Martial Arts Teacher, is very much about not the technical standard, but the professional standards of how you teach. Okay. In, in the context of you know, traditional martial arts. Then you, of course, have the um, moral and ethical standards that are often bound up with culture. Um, in some countries and places, it is, for instance, quite legitimate and common for uh, martial arts instructors to have sexual relationships with female students or vice versa, female instructors with male students, and to take advantage of their position. In Israeli and American and Canadian culture, while it happens, and sometimes it happens for good. Some, sometimes it's, I mean, I have a colleague who married his student and they're happily married and it's, it's a very good thing to have happened. But typically what happens in our cultures is that at best there are hard feelings and at worst it, it gets into, you know, it, it borderlines the criminality or gets in there. So mm-hmm. that that's very culture dependent. I think in, in, in China, I don't know nowadays, but traditionally so, yeah, a teacher could marry his student. Like the Chinese would probably wouldn't make a big wouldn't big fuss sense. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Also in also in Japan. Also in Japan. Um, so technical standard, professional standard, ethical moral standard, all of these things. And then in my personal instruction in, and in many lineages of traditional Chinese martial arts, you've got the Confucian standard. Confucian standard has to do with hierarchy. So What kind of higher now with traditional Chinese teachers originally, what they had is um, what they would call often in the United States called customers and disciples. Customer would be anybody who's not a disciple and those people would pay and they would literally treat them as if they were uh, hopefully a courteous uh, person selling them something at the food store. Right, uh, right. or or very courteous waiter. And that's how they treat that customer. Like, what do you want to eat? Okay, I'll, I'll serve you that. Oh, tomorrow you want to eat that? Okay, I'll serve you this. I don't mind. You pay, you decide. But that's the, that's the deepest our relationship is ever going to get. And you can tip me. Yeah, you, you can bribe the teacher with gifts and money and whatnot, but we're not going to be buddies and we're not going to be close. And... Then for select students, for specific reasons, everybody with their standards, they might end up um, in a ceremony called a baisher, become someone's disciple, and then they enter the Gong Fu family. And within the Gong Fu family, there is a father-son relationship, um, hopefully, um, and sometimes it's a bit difficult. Sometimes you treat each other more like an elder brother and younger brother if you're close in age. Uh, For this reason, traditionally, the Chinese people would typically not teach someone who's too close to them in age or older than them. I know a few instances where someone really wanted to study, but they were close to close in age to the instructor. So the teacher would say, well, you know, I teach as a friend. Like, come on, we'll just be friends. Let's be friends. Let's go out eat together. We're friends from the beginning. You're not a customer. You're not a disciple. We're we're just going to be friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's better that way, especially in the context of Chinese culture. That's not going to cause us too too much trouble. So with me in my school, in my organization, what we do is uh, there is a technical stand. There are 18 grades and you need to hit a certain grade in order to become an instructor if you want to. Um, And they're not only technical standards, but from certain grades onwards, you got to be, you have to demonstrate a a minimal level of scholarship, you know, for instance, you, you've got to have read, say, 20 books and 50 articles about the martial arts. And I'm not going to test you on them. That's on you. But there are certain standards. I I test the physical aspects, you know, but I trust you. And I will sort of question you and we'll see how much you know. And I meet you every class. So I sort of know. And, but there's also in parallel with that, the, the family standards, right? The Confucian hierarchy and whether or not you're going to become a disciple. Well, in, in Chinese culture, traditionally, 
the student who is interested in, in discipleship is supposed to ask that of the shifu. However, in the West, we have a problem with people not being, most of them not being too familiar with that sort of culture. And even if they are, they, they typically do not know that they are supposed to approach the shifu and ask. Um, I know um, my colleague and friend, Shif Shifu Master Neil Ripsky from Canada, who's an excellent martial artist, he approached at least one of his teachers and he asked. If he hadn't asked, he wouldn't be offered. But people don't know. So I actually ended up having to propose to students if they want to do this and enter the Kung Fu family, which is really suboptimal, but that's what we get in the West because people are not familiar. It's partly why I write a lot of articles and books and, rec and record lectures on my podcast, on my channel, a podcast called Jadecast. Jade like the stone jade, cast like podcasts, one word, Jadecast. And I do so so people would be more intimately familiar with Chinese culture and they could figure these things out on their own. So if people want to do this, there is a ceremony. They have to first abide by a certain level, minimal level of a technical standard to prove themselves. And then usually... Uh, I would give them a challenge, a personal challenge that pertains to, to their, um, their flaws of character. I'll touch upon that in a sec. And then if they have proven themselves, there's a ceremony and, and there are many witnesses. I bring all the students. I try to bring as many of my Kung Fu brothers and teachers. And we take pictures and they are accepted as uh, members of the Kung Fu family. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they would teach. Only if they are at the higher standard and they want to teach, then they will teach. They, yeah. they, have to, they have to choose to be disciples and separately they have to choose to be teachers and they're not necessarily uh, have to, to be both at the same time. Now, in terms of um, a test of character. So I'll give you examples for tests of characters that, that I've handed out over the years. Um, one person did not abide by it, two did. One guy was quite young. He was, I think, 18 years old, and he needed discipline. So I told him, no, I'm, like, if you want to do this, you, you have to prove, not to me, prove to yourself that you can generate discipline of your own volition. So we're going to set a benchmark. You are going to have to practice martial arts for six hours a day for a month, which is very difficult to do, especially when you're 18 years old yeah. and your hormones are raging. He did it. He, he practiced for six hours a day for a month and eventually he discipled. And another guy, Yaniv, I think he smoked cigarettes for 20 years. And it was kind of harsh of me to do. It's, it's not something that I would do with other people, but with him, it was appropriate because of the the kind of relationship we had. Again, this is my thing. This is not, the, the test of character is something I added because we're here in Western culture and, and people need this. It's not necessarily something that all, mo, even most Chinese teachers would do. Told him, look, you told me many times you want to quit smoking. He told me that first. It's not my idea. You've been smoking 20 years. There aren't going to be any smokers in my Kung Fu family. You got to quit smoking. He quit smoking. Eventually disciple. He did it. Um, he, he's very thankful that, that I helped give him that, that yeah. push, you know? That's fantastic. And, and then the, and there's another guy, a third guy, I would name him. Um, his test, for instance, was um, he, he had issues with losing weight. Now, he wasn't obese or anything, but like he had those uh, extra, say, 40 pounds that he needed to shed off. Um, and he wouldn't be like, real skinny if you should lose 40 pounds you'd be all right uh and i gave him that test but didn't work out but he also like in the process of you know he sort of swayed away in other directions um he's a musician does other things with his life very creative person he did great for himself um but he saw that he's not gonna abide by that standard and that's fine i I'm, yeah. i don't i wouldn't judge anybody for for not but you got, and, and you know what, if they came in and they said, you know, I, maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe is this a good test instead? I might go for it. But they have to prove to themselves that they are worthy in order that they respect that sort of status that they're getting better, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, hey, Jonathan, we are 
we're officially at 90 minutes here. So I think we'll, I think we'll go ahead and, and probably call it that in terms of topics. Um, did you, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to throw out there before we, we finish this off for today? Well, you know what, in light of everything we've discussed today, I want to say that as a martial artist, my understanding of the martial arts benefited quite a bit from intercultural studies and intercultural exchange. I think that for anyone who would like to be a scholar of his craft, to be a true professional who understands where his arts came from, how they are seen and observed and function in light of the society in which he lives and other places, and how they really seep into and affect people's hearts. It is, in my opinion, essential to get that intercultural exposure. It can be gone in many ways. The best way is arguably to go and actually live in other countries for at least a month or two months here and there, preferably six months or, or longer. But um, it can be had also from watching a lot of videos and reading and um, talking with other people and meeting people of different cultures and ethnicities and sort of inquire how they see their own martial arts or they see your martial art from a different perspective. And in particular, if you practice a traditional martial art, I think it is quite important to invest in the study of the culture from once it came. It is crucial and essential, and especially with respect to Chinese and Japanese martial arts, um, it is a necessity, not solely for those who want to teach those martial arts, but also for those who have been practicing them for, say, at least three or five years and really want to understand them. You would be surprised of how cultural studies and even language studies and certainly philosophy, the philosophy of the culture from whence those arts came, are going to they often, very often, directly affect the way that you physically practice techniques without having gotten a hands-on instruction, which is very necessary from a teacher. The actual culture is going to speak through your hands. And uh, this is the message that I had in mind for today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will say that, uh, you know, obviously um, I've talked to a, a, a huge number of, of martial artists over the years. And, and um, this is not the, this is a relatively unique perspective, right? This is not usually the um, type of conversation that takes place. And obviously I've enjoyed all of these other conversations, but this is, this is such a unique look and, um, I agree with you. I think, you know, having spent a, a lot of time myself in the Philippines, I feel like um, it is, it's ultra important. And I think that your, your points on the matter um, would, it would be good for, for people to take that to heart. So, um, so yeah, so I, I certainly, certainly appreciate having you and getting a chance for us to, to chat I know that we've, we've kind of floated around in similar circles over the years, but have never, never really talked. So it's nice to hop on and, and, and get a, a chance to talk. And um, hopefully we can do more of that in the future. So <laughs> Indeed, Josh, I very much appreciate the opportunity. Um, two things I would like to add. First of all, um, it would be my pleasure to come back to the show and discuss with you the similarities and differences between Chinese and Filipino cultures and martial arts, which is something yeah. we, we, we were hoping to get to, but we hadn't gotten right. to. So many things, right, to talk mm -hmm. about. So. And, and another thing is, uh, for listeners, if you enjoyed our talk today, please, by all means, go on Amazon and check out my books, books such as Research of Martial Arts or The Martial Arts Teacher. I'm certain that you would enjoy them. Yeah, and we'll we're gonna go ahead and post all that stuff up. I went in on Amazon and took took a look uh, before before we hopped on, and it's it's a very very interesting and eclectic set of books that I think for martial arts 
scholars and 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 practitioners is would be very interesting so we'll, we'll include links to all that stuff in the in the in the um comments and i certainly would urge people to go check that out so um so yeah so we'll close up i, I if you want to do a part two and, and talk very specifically about those differences you know i i think that it would be a uh, quite an interesting conversation and um so we can we can certainly plan on that at some point so we will make it happen and listeners if you have any further questions for us or either of us then feel free to leave them in the comments we'll answer yes. them i always i love reading comments it's fun so um absolutely feel free to do that and um and we will we'll we'll answer for sure and uh jonathan will will have to tag you in there so that people can can reach out to you in whichever ways you you prefer as well so yeah certainly all right well have a have a good evening out there in israel and again we appreciate the time and uh we'll be in touch soon thank you so much and as we say in israel shabbat shalom All right. Shabbat shalom. Is that Yes, right? indeed. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Bye-bye. We'll take care and we'll, we'll talk soon. And thanks to all our listeners for joining us today. For show notes and more great tips, be sure to visit us at plumdragonherbs.com. And if you liked this episode, we'd love for you to share and subscribe wherever you like to listen. If this episode has sparked more questions for you, we invite you to check out our new private forum with Josh Walker as our moderator, where you can get answers to some of your toughest questions on herbalism and martial arts. Click the banner at the top of our website page for more information. Thank you.